Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Faith Bridge. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's not a good sign when you have to have a swig of water before you begin. <laughs> Tonight is our third. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tonight is our third uh, Freedom Basics class. And uh, I thought before we begin, I'd like to just tell you uh, what my encounter with Kairos was. About a year ago, Pastor Ken had mentioned to me that he heard uh, of Kairos, and, and did I know what it was? So I began to do some investigating and discovered Kairos that is uh, offered at Gateway in Dallas. So I went in January of last year, and uh, it was an incredible experience. I could not get over how effective uh, a, a tool, an instrument it was to bring people to a place in these various topics that we cover where they can understand them and then actually have a time before the Lord to deal with it. And so I was just blown away by it. Uh, further, we found that they are so generous that they, in fact, have training. And so a team of us from Faithbridge went back uh, several times, and they have these training workshops where they go through the whole curriculum with us and model certain things for us and even go as far as saying, this is our curriculum. We, they developed this now more than 10 years ago. And when they started, there were 25 people at their first Kairos conference. Now they have four a year, and there's approximately 1,200 people. So they said, here's our material, go forth, be blessed, and multiply. And so that is what we are hoping to do right here at Faithbridge. And I, I share this with you because I want you to know that um, this is not curriculum that I have come up with or we have come up with. We rely extensively on the guidelines and the, the outlines that we received from them. And I am very, very grateful for the person who began this and for the team in Kairos that have continued to build on this. Okay, let's pray and then we'll get started. Father God, we thank you for tonight. And we can just say, we welcome you in this place. Lord, be with us as we learn truths about you uh, and you begin to show us truths about ourself. I pray, God, that you will speak to our hearts, open our eyes, break down that resistance that we have inside when we hear things that we don't like. And help us to see all of this through your eyes and through the love that you have for us. Lord, I just ask you to uh, protect us, our minds against distractions, to help us focus for the whole time uh, and be in this moment. And God, I ask that you will help me. Uh, help me to speak the truths that you want me to speak. Help me to remember everything. And peace, bless this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so identity theft is a very common thing these days. Has anybody here had their identity stolen? A few. If you have or you have known somebody who has had their identity stolen, you will know that it is a pain. It causes so much inconvenience and people spend months sometimes uh, even having to employ somebody and pay them to help pretty much get their identity back and re-establish their identity. <clears throat> but identity theft has been around for a long, long time. In fact, since the beginning of time. Tonight we're going to discuss a different kind of identity theft. This is identity theft by somebody who is a master at it. He works overtime to get my identity and your identity. 
In John 10, 10, we read that he is a thief who comes to steal and kill and destroy. And everyone is a target. He does a lot of damage and he often gets away with it because firstly, we don't know who we are in Christ. And secondly, we don't know how to recognize the enemy. Think about this, do you think Prince William, the fact that he is royalty and that he is heir to the throne of England, do you think that affects how he thinks about himself? Yes, he definitely does. So what is our identity? In Galatians 3 we see, so in Christ Jesus, we are all children of God through faith. And in 2 Corinthians 6, 18, God says, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. There are many Bible verses that tell us who we are in Christ, what our identity in Christ is. The fact is, we are children of God. We are royalty. Let's read Matthew 3.16. I have a confession to make. I forgot my large print Bible. And I have looked in all of the Bibles here and I cannot read them. <laughs> it's too little. So I have some notes and we're going to not read through the whole chapter. Please do it if you feel like it. I'm gonna just refer to my notes. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus had just been baptized. He comes out of the water, God speaks and says, this is my son and I love him. I've often wondered what that sounded like. I've often wondered, is it this huge, big, booming Reverend T.G. Jake's voice, or is it more like Morgan Freeman? At any rate, I know Jesus heard him, and I think everybody else heard him because they told Matthew, and he wrote it down, and so today we're still reading about it. So it wasn't like God whispered this, everybody heard it. <clears throat> then in chapter four, Jesus is led into the desert. Jesus was led by the spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, Jesus answered him by saying, it is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. And again he said, if you are the son of God. Over the years, I have heard many sermons on this passage. And I have always thought that the point of the passage was to show us that the devil even tempted Jesus, and the way Jesus dealt with it was by quoting scripture back to him. So when we're tempted, the way we're gonna resist the temptation of the devil is to quote scripture back to him. And it is that too. But when I went to Kairos, I learned that there's something else. What the devil does here is he says, if you are the son of God, and he brings into question who Jesus is. He asks God himself, if you are the son of God. If Satan was prepared to make Jesus think about his identity, don't you think he's going to try it on us? He is. He does, he is persistent, and he will try over and over. 
He has four specific strategies that he uses <clears throat> to steal our identity. And we will cover these in depth at the Kairos Freedom Conference. But each of these topics has its own session at the conference. Tonight, we are going to touch on them briefly. The first one is called soul wounds. We can also refer to them as emotional hurts and traumas. How many of you have heard, time heals everything? Is it true? No. Time does not heal anything. The only thing that happens over time is that we learn to live with that hurtful thing. One way or another, we learn to get by. <coughs> time doesn't heal our wounds. Only Jesus can do that. And he tells us in Luke 4, verse 18, that he came to preach the gospel, to heal our bodies, and to free the prisoners and the oppressed. Now, if we take language like that literally, we might think, well, it doesn't apply to me because uh, I'm not sick right now and I'm not in prison and I don't particularly feel like I'm oppressed. But of course, he means that in a spiritual sense. So he comes to heal our bodies and our souls. He sets us free from the consequences of sin and the influence the enemy has on us. And he comes to take away our physical and our emotional pain. One of the biggest problems that we have, most of us, is that we are very good at pretending that we are not hurt. We cover up our struggles. We mask our pain so well that we can't even show it to the only one who can help us to Jesus. We have conditioned ourselves to say, I'm fine. When somebody asks you how you're doing, what is your standard response? I'm fine. I will be walking down the hallway and as I'm going past somebody, I will say, how are you doing? And they say, I'm fine. And I'm already five steps away when they're answering me. Nobody would think of saying, I'm desperate. My heart is breaking. Please help me. And honestly, if they did, I think we would freak out because I don't think we would know how to respond to that. Now, I'm definitely not suggesting that you spill your guts to everybody who asks you how you are doing. But what I am saying is that when God asks you, how are you doing? Let's spill our guts. In a room this size, there are all kinds of pain. Some people have had to endure awful things. If we sat in a circle and I started asking us to share the source of your pain, we would go through lots of tissues. But before you panic, we are not going to be doing that, don't worry. My point is that there are many things that hurt us, but the pain is not usually the problem. I don't want to diminish our pain. I don't want to diminish that painful event that happened, that hurtful thing that somebody said to you so many years ago and caused damage to you. But the pain, that thing, is usually not the problem. The problem is we took that thing and to it we attached some value judgment about ourselves, And that is the thing that causes the damage. That is the lie that the enemy tells us about a certain event and that is the lie we believe Let's say somebody was molested as a child. They might start thinking that they are damaged goods. They might start thinking nobody will want them. They may even go as far as thinking that it was their fault. How hard do you think it would be for somebody like that 
to enter into a normal relationship and to have a healthy, normal relationship when they believe things like that about themselves. The devil takes deep wounds that we have and he gets us stuck in a place where we cannot get rid of it. That event continues to have an influence over my behavior. That event continues to hurt me long after it took place and sometimes even long after I've already forgotten about it. My husband Peter is a motor vehicle enthusiast. He likes taking very old motor cars and motorcycles and rebuilding them. And before we were married and had children, I was very involved in his hobby because, you know, a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do. <laughs> so we worked together. And I don't mean I brought him his lunch and just sat next to the car, no. I learned how to strip engines and put them together. I learned how to reupholster the inside of cars. Uh, and we did many motor car rallies together and motorcycle rallies together. Over the last 32 years, I have learned a lot about motor cars and motor vehicles. But one of the really interesting things I learned is the power of rust. Okay. When the paint on a car, or anything that is made of metal, is damaged, whether it's a little, little ding, or a huge, big, fat hole, if that metal is exposed to the elements, it will begin to rust. And if it's not treated quickly and accurately, that rust will continue to eat away at that piece of metal until eventually it's destroyed the whole thing. Now, if you notice the little thing and you just paint over it, that also doesn't solve the problem because the rust will continue to grow underneath the paint and eventually it's going to erupt and the piece of metal underneath will be destroyed. The other thing I know about rust is this. It's actually very easy to fix. So when Peter, one of his things, has a piece of rust <laughs> or metal exposed, he will immediately apply a rust killer, and then he'll paint over it, and that'll be the end of that. If we see rust and paint over it, if we just cover up, like we usually do, that thing sits underneath and continues to grow. Because I really think that soul wounds are like rust in this way. Big or small, if it's left untreated, it will grow bigger and bigger and it will affect huger areas of our life. But if we recognize them and we deal with them quickly and effectively, then that's the end of that. So, the devil uses soul wounds to steal our identity. The second thing he uses is core lies. Core lies are formed like this. We are hurt by something that happens to us or something that somebody says to us. We don't know how to deal with it or to recover from it, and so we cover it up. The enemy comes and he says, let me help you interpret that thing. And we begin to believe lies. There are three kinds of lies that we believe. We believe lies about God. We believe lies about ourselves and we believe lies about other people. It sounds something like this. If God really loved me, why did he let that happen to me? Or, I deserved that. That was my fault. Or, I can't trust anybody. 
every man will hurt me and every woman is going to leave me. Maybe tonight you can identify some similar thoughts that you have had. Scripture says Satan was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. These are strong words. He is a murderer from the beginning. His primary weapon against us is lies, and he will twist the truth and take away our freedom. And the battleground for all of this is in our mind. Soul wounds, the hurt we felt, become core lies. And from core lies, we develop something which is called strongholds. A stronghold is a way of thinking that influences our behavior. We believe this is how life is, this is how, is how it's always going to be, but that belief is contrary to God and to the word. A stronghold is formed like this. First, there's a negative event. It can be big or it can be small. It hurts, it humiliates, or it betrays us. For example, an adult who should have cared for you as a child, but hurt you physically and emotionally. Sometimes, sometime in school, my guess would be in junior high, you were teased and you were left out of the group. Then you got to high school and no matter how hard you tried, you never made the team and you weren't part of the in crowd. Then you graduated and you went to college and things got a little bit out of hand and before you knew it, you were pregnant and maybe even had an abortion or you dropped out and when you went home, your father told you that he knew you would never amount to anything. You got married, but that didn't work out. And now you're divorced. Or you're still single and you're wondering, what is wrong with me? And I can go on like that all night. Once a core lie develops and we believe it, we are on our way to having a stronghold. Now we develop a mechanism to protect ourselves from the hurt by building a fence around our heart. And we make ourselves some promises. No one is going to do that to me ever again. I will never trust anybody. I am never good enough. And now there is a stronghold. Our defense mechanism begins to push the people around us away, which reinforces the lie that we believe. And it sounds like this. I don't want to be rejected, so I will go ahead and reject you first. Now, I've believed the lie that nobody wants to be around me because, and it has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I cannot figure out why my relationships never work out all in the same way the person finally withdraws from me and I'm alone all over again, which reinforces the belief that I can't trust anybody and I am not good enough for anybody. This is a stronghold and it continues to hurt us long after the initial event 
that made us believe that took place. Last week, I told you a little bit about my uh, circumstances as a child. At the early years of my life, I was hurt by my dad, physically and emotionally. And then my parents were divorced, and it was a very traumatic divorce. And we were sent to go live with my grandparents. Uh, we went back to my mom, and I had to step into being an adult. I was grown up. I had to take care of things. And watching my mother struggle and work hard to put food on the table made me determined that I was never going to find myself in that situation, nor was I going to be held back by my circumstances. So I took my little broken heart and I put it in a safe place and I decided I will never give it to anybody else to break again. As you can see, my situation had had a profound effect on the things I believed about God and about myself and about other people. It had shaped my plans for the future. Now I had a plan. It wasn't very dignified or very godly, but I'll share it with you. This is what it was. I was going to go to law school and become a lawyer so that I could nail every man to the wall who was hurting his family and watch him squirm. <laughs> I scoffed at the idea of marriage and getting married, being a wife and having children was not on my to-do list. With this in mind, off I went to law school, and it wasn't long before I became part of a group of friends, and I met Peter. So he was a guy, good looking, blue eyes, and a great smile. But looks had long ago ceased to impress me. This poor unsuspecting guy wanted to date me, but I was like a porcupine with little prickles so that nobody could get close to me emotionally. What impressed me about Peter was that he was kind and he was patient and he was thoughtful and he was gentle, but he didn't fool me. I kept thinking, you can't go on like this for very much longer. I am just waiting for you to slip up and then you are busted. <coughs> Well, Peter spent many months just working on being my friend. And then much to my surprise, many more months working on becoming my boyfriend. So believe me when I tell you that this was not easy to do. I was cynical and I was distrustful and I had a 38 special in my purse and I knew how to use it. Strongholds can be very subtle, and we may not even recognize that we have them. For much of our lives, we partner with the enemy to sabotage our own life, and we don't even realize that we are doing it. So we dated for three years, and then we got married. But it was about four more years before I finally believed that this man will never leave me and he will never hurt me. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for him to prove to me over and over and over that he loved me unconditionally, that I could trust him? I think it's nothing short of a miracle. And I have shared this with many people before, and I believe it, that it is proof for me of how much God loves me, that he sent that man into my life. Because anybody else would have quit, but he stuck with it. Through Peter, and subsequently through the birth of my children, God began to heal my heart. And it is a journey that I am still walking with him. Those strongholds in my life were so powerful that to this day, they can influence my responses to the people who love me and who care for me. I still have trust issues. 
And my independence is regularly misunderstood by people. I have to remind myself regularly that I am the child of God, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made in his image, that Jesus died for me and that now I am God's daughter and the Bible tells me I am a co-heir with Christ, which means I get to inherit part of my father's kingdom. These words tells me that I'm loved unconditionally by God my Father, and that he wants good things for me. So you might ask, how do I know if I've believed a lie? Or how do I know that there is a stronghold in my heart? It is when our beliefs about ourself, or about God, or about other people, don't line up with what God says and we recognize certain behavioral patterns in our life that are contrary to what God's word wants for us, we could have a stronghold. If there is an area in your life that you cannot seem to get under control, it may be because of a stronghold. If your gut response in certain situations is the same every time and it is not good, you may have a stronghold. You may have a string of failed relationships. You may have been fired from your job over and over and over. You cannot get rid of some addictions that you have. All of these things can be fueled by strongholds. So we have to identify everything in our thinking and take it back to the truth. Which truth? God's truth. He has a lot to say about who we are. He has a lot to say about how he made us and how who he redeemed us to be. Remember last week we said the definition of freedom was to become the person who God made and redeemed us to be. But this means you have to know the truth because Satan relies on the fact that we don't know what God says about us. And he relies on the fact that we don't know how to recognize him. When we read the passage in Matthew, we saw how Jesus handled Satan. He said to Satan, we don't just live on food. We live on the word of God. That is our spiritual food. So when we begin to know God like this, we can spot the lies and we can stop the enemy from lying to us more. We can pull it out like weeds and we can get rid of it in Jesus' name. But you have to be able to spot it. So in 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 10, verse four and five, we see that the weapons we fight with are not of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This is a battle for how we think in our hearts, what we believe. Last week we looked at the scripture in Proverbs that said, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. As we begin to understand our identity in Christ, we are able to resist the lies. We're able to identify when the enemy is attacking us. The enemy wants to make us less. But scripture tells us that through God, we have divine power to stand against him. He would like to cripple us emotionally because when he makes us feel like that, he prevents us from being who God made us to be, using the gifts and the talents that he has given us for his purposes. God made us all different. Everyone 
has something that they can contribute to the kingdom. So don't you think that if the enemy wanted to stop you from being effective, for stop you from filling the purposes God has for you, that he's gonna take the wind out of your sails so that you cannot be that person that God made you to be and go do that thing that he says he's prepared for you to go and do. Figure out who you are in God, in Christ, and embrace who you are. Learn what you're good at, what are your strengths, and ask God how you can use those things for his kingdom. The third thing the enemy uses is life patterns. <clears throat> now these are behavior patterns that we have learned from our family of origin. This is how we were raised. Whether or not you like it, they help make you who you are today. The good, the bad, and the ugly, we can look back and see things in our family, sometimes even from generation to generation to generation. Sort of like being an Aggie in Texas. Some of these family things are things that we want to embrace and we want to continue those traditions. But some of them not so much. Things like violence, aggression, verbal abuse and all kinds of other dysfunctional behavior. When we are finally old enough and we get to move, we want to leave those things behind and just move on when we start a new family. But as we drive away, what we don't realize is we have this huge trunk that's coming with us. Now it's tightly locked up, but it's there. So uh, it comes with us wherever we go. Often other people can see our trunk, but we can't see it. One day something happens and it triggers those locks and that thing pops open and all kinds of stuff comes crawling out. Things that you've been stashing in there for years. It is important to do due diligence and look at our families and the things, the behavior that we learned from our families, especially when we enter into new relationships. Many of these things are not necessarily good or bad, they're just different. But we still need to know about them because it can create a place in our family that can cause strife and can give the devil a place to attack us. <clears throat> so when I grew up, this is how we handled conflict. If something bothered us, we were encouraged to go to that person and share it with them and we would deal with it and it would be done. My mother, if we made her angry for whatever reason, <clears throat> she would also deal with it right there and then. It looked a little bit like a thunderstorm in summer. You would see the clouds gather on the horizon and then you would hear the rumble of the faraway thunder and then maybe there was some lightning and then suddenly it would rain hard. And then the sun shines and it's a beautiful day and we're done. Now my husband, he comes from a family where nobody ever talked about anything that was even slightly confrontational. Nobody ever raised their voices. It was all the stiff upper lip, you know. And it was a good example, I thought, of wonderful self-control. But what my husband learned was that when somebody in his family offended him or hurt him or did something, this is what he did. He had to just put it away and pretend it never happened. So, then we got married. To say that it was interesting to figure out how to resolve conflict is an understatement because I would like, I wanted to just reign and get it over with while he refused to see that there was even a cloud. I also believe that you don't go to bed when you're angry, so I lay awake many nights, and he slept like a log, thinking that when he wakes up in the morning, the weather is going to be all clear. 
But no, there was still a little thundercloud hovering around. It took us a while to figure this out. Our life patterns play out like this. Man, I cannot believe this is happening to me again. There was this person at my work who got on my nerves and finally I got rid of them because I left and went somewhere else only to find that he's been reincarnated in this another person who is getting on my nerves all over again. When we notice destructive patterns, broken relationships, addictions, abuse, it is so worth looking back to find the root cause because it might be in our family of origin. We might look back at things in the past that we didn't like and think, that is behind me. But if we haven't actually given it to God and allowed Him to work through that and to heal us, it may be behind you but it's still in the trunk with you. These things we drag with us into the office, into our marriage, into our children's lives, and they can continue to wreak havoc in our lives unless we identify what they are and we address them. God wants to free us from all of that. So what stops us from giving it to God? Well, before I can give something away, I have to own it. I can't give away something that isn't mine. When Adam and Eve left, uh, were in the garden, they left us a little gift that influences us still today and gets us in trouble all the time. <clears throat> Eve ate the apple and you know the rest of the story. Well, when God found them, he did a little debriefing interview with them. And they blamed each other and then they blamed the snake. And since then, that is what we do. When we have a certain thing that we haven't owned as our own, we blame somebody else for it. And it might sound something like this. I am not okay and it's your fault. Or I am not okay and it's because of this situation. Uh, now, when we have a problem and we refuse to own that problem, God can't deal with it because we are not able to release it to him. If you ask a small child, who did this when there's two or three of them in the room? Who spilt this? Who dropped this? They're always going to say, he did it, she did it. And the funny thing is we didn't have to teach them to blame. They were just born knowing that they can blame. So sometimes it's hard to face our own struggles because we are trapped in a cycle of blame. Have you known people who just will not accept responsibility for the things that go wrong in their life? It's very difficult to help somebody like that. Now the reality is, sometimes our circumstances are bad. And getting away from them is absolutely necessary for, for our physical and our mental well-being. I don't ever want to downplay the truth that some people are trapped in a situation that is dangerous and destructive and their first step towards healing is to get out of that situation. What I want to say though is that we can be free no matter what our situation, no matter what our circumstances. Everybody in this room can be free because our freedom is not dependent on other people in our life. That is the great news. No one can hold you back from taking your baggage to Jesus and dealing with it. But you have to stop blaming it on other people and other things. You have to own it before that can happen. And if there is a person who has hurt you and is still hurting you, 
You may have to forgive that person and release them so that you can walk away from that hurtful thing that started hurting you and continues to hurt you until you have released that person. Now, at the Kairos Conference, we deal in depth with forgiveness because forgiveness is easier said than done. The Bible makes it very clear that forgiveness is not a choice. It's mandatory. We have to forgive because if we don't, it put, drives a wedge in between me and God and I cannot hear him and communicate with him. So we have to deal with unforgiveness in our life. So Satan tries to use our life patterns to steal our identity by making us believe that it has always been like this in my life and it will continue to be like this in my life. But that is a lie. The fourth tactic that Satan uses is demonic oppression. So the other day, somebody called to order a pizza. And when the person answered the phone, uh, they took the order and asked for the three-digit security code on the card. And this person said, 666. All of a sudden, it went very quiet at the other end of the phone. And he heard her whisper, I think the devil just ordered a pizza. <laughs> what should I do? So do we really have to talk about demons? Yes, we really do, because they are real. Before God even made the world, there was a revolution in heaven. It was a power play, and when it was over, God banished the angel Lucifer, and one third of the angels went from him, with him. Ever since then, there has been this cosmic battle for the souls of men. Now, in the modern world, we are very uncomfortable to talk about this. We are so intellectual that it is quite uncivilized for us to even consider the idea of demons and of evil. So we try and say everything has a natural cause and everything has a scientific explanation. But what do we do about the fact that there are 61 verses in the New Testament that talk about demons? Let's just read some of these Bible verses about demons. In Matthew chapter eight, verse 16, when evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed the sick. And in Mark chapter three, verse 14, and he appointed the 12 so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. And again in Mark chapter six, verse 12, they went out and they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and were anointing many sick people with oil and healing them. And in Mark 16, and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name, they will drive out demons. So when it comes to demons in our culture today, there are basically two camps. Those who believe that demons don't exist and uh, those who believe that there's a demon behind every bush. So here's a story. It's a little boy, Jeremiah, loved to go and play in his neighbor's yard. His mother didn't feel that that was safe and she continuously told him that he should stay home. One day she said to him, Jeremiah, why do you always disobey me and go play in the neighbor's yard? He said, well, it's the devil that tempts me, mommy. She said, okay. So Jeremiah, this is what you need to do. The next time the devil tempts you, you need to say, say to him, get behind me, Satan, and then you'll be okay. Well, she built a fence around the yard and that worked well for about a week. One day she's standing inside looking through the window and there's a hole in the fence and Jeremiah is in the neighbor's yard playing and she calls him, Jeremiah, come here. He comes through, she says, Jeremiah, 
Did I not tell you to say, Satan, get behind me when he is tempting you? He said, yes, mommy, but I did, I did. I said, get behind me, Satan. And when he was behind me, he just pushed me through the hole. <laughs> there are two opposite camps, but there is actually a middle road. It's important that we have a balanced understanding about who the devil is and who demons are. C.S. Lewis said, whether or not you pay no attention to them or whether you pay too much attention to them, the devil is pleased with either outcome. There is a spiritual world, there is a devil, there are demons, and the devil wants to steal your lunch. But God gave us the authority and the power to stand against that. And we all know what happened on the cross and how the victory was won. In Luke 10 verse 19, we read that I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. And in Luke 10, we see the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Last week, I used the example of uh, leaving your front door open when you go out, and when you return, there's somebody in your house stealing your stuff. If we've left doors in our heart open, we have left a way for the enemy to attack us. Paul says in Ephesians 4, do not give the devil a foothold, which means that we can do things that gives the devil a foothold in our hearts. Things like bitterness, anger, jealousy, pride, doubt, unforgiveness, willful disobedience, inner vows, sexual sin, addictions, and many, many more things. Open the door, sometimes just a little crack, sometimes wide open for the enemy to come and influence us. These things keep us from having the freedom in Christ which we read about in the Bible. The good news about all of this is that the enemy cannot stop us from going to Jesus. When we make a decision to surrender our hurt God will heal it. But the thing that holds us back is our pride. We have a choice to line up with what God says about who we are. Or we have the choice to line up with what the devil says we are and continue to hurt ourselves and the people in our lives. <clears throat> Freedom from demonic oppression is not about getting the devil out because he isn't in us. It is about understanding that the Holy Spirit is in us. And if we start tapping into the presence of the Holy Spirit, he fills us with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, self-control. He fills us with these things and the doors are closed and the kingdom of God reigns in my heart. And when the devil swings by, he sees God in there and he can do nothing but leave. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. Everyone is a target, and he does a lot of damage. But if we understand our identity in the light of scripture, and we believe God, we have divine power to take down these strongholds. With modern identity theft, when our identity is stolen, it takes a lot of effort, sometimes money, to get your identity reestablished. 
But as a believer, Jesus made the effort and he paid the price to reestablish our identity in Christ. And all we have to do is to believe him. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you did not just leave us down here uh, to muddle through, but that we can go to you and your word and through the helper that you gave us, we are able to understand what you did for us and who we are and what you have promised for us and what our future is. And we just thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you will help us, give us the courage to be honest with ourselves. Give us the courage to seek help. Give us the courage, Father, to deal with the issues that are preventing us from experiencing you to the fullest. Lord, I just pray that you will be with each person here tonight. And in a very personal way, speak to their lives, speak to them. Help them identify the thing you want them to deal with. Lord, we thank you that we are all on this road, that we are all walking towards that day when we will be completely completely free when you finally return. We just thank you, Father, for your loving, gracious patience with us. Please be with us for the rest of this week. And thank you for this time together. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we will have some prayer partners here. If you would like to pray with somebody, please feel free to find somebody and uh, allow them to pray with you. And the other thing I wanted to share, which I forgot in the beginning, was uh, we've had several people say they wish that the conference wasn't all the way in September because it's so far away. Well, I would like to encourage you uh, to go to the Freedom Conference in Dallas in April. As much as we wanted to have one now, it's new and we are having to learn how to do a bunch of things and we just couldn't get it together to have one in the spring. But I know many faith bridges who are going in April and I want to encourage you, go online, register, it's free. You go there and you attend the conference. You obviously have to pay for your accommodation. But if you really feel like you've begun something now and you wanna not break the momentum, you wanna continue, I wanna encourage you. I'm going, again, uh, to go. Take the time for yourself. It's the end of April. I believe it's the mm, 28th or 9th or, but if you, gate, if you Google Gateway, uh, Kairos, it will come up. So thank you, have a good evening. <laughs>